So now that it's 6 p.m., uh, let's formally get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I, I, I don't know the numbers of people on the various platforms, but uh, thank you for making time. Uh, it's Wednesday evening IST, and, and uh, God knows where you are. But uh, today, um, our topic for this series of meetups, this is the second in the series of meetups. Uh, the overall series is called Making Data Science Work, where the focus is actually putting data science to work, putting things into production, getting ROI from your data science initiatives, as opposed to it being exploratory. And today's session sort of hits the nail squarely on the head because the theme is on the productionization of ML models. And uh, we searched high and low for some people that we thought were credible, some people who have faced the firing line and lived to tell. Uh, so today with us, we've got Nishchal and Aditya. So Nishchal works for a company called Omnius. Uh, Aditya works for currently for Glance at Inmobi, but there are updates on both fronts. For on Nishchal's side, I would love for him to tell us a little bit about what Omnius does and then his role there. And similarly, Aditya, what is the flux that's going on? Uh, and once we have a few of those details in, we'll dive into the meat and potatoes of uh, what it takes to, to put models into production. How does one go from exploratory and how does one feel the sweaty palms that get involved, that are involved in actually taking these models to production? So Nishal, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'd love to start with you. If you could tell us a little bit about uh, your journey in brief and where you are today at Omnius. You're, you're based in Berlin and you're joining us from there. Please tell us a little yeah. bit more. Okay, thank you, Indra. Uh, definitely have lived for for a while now with deploying models. Uh, don't know how long that's going to sustain. I hope for quite some time. Uh, I'm Nishchal. I'm the VP of technology at Omnius. And uh, thank you for Scribble Data for having me. Uh, Omnius is a Berlin-based AI company that's building products in the insurance industry for claims automation. And uh, insurance industry in general is a, is a different type of an industry where there's more uh, interaction in forms that have not evolved to the extent uh, that you can assume in other industries. And of course, they're rethinking uh, of their entire claims handling process. And we are one of the uh, probably the foremost enablers in this industry uh, in making that happen. Indira, you're on mute. <laughs> Dear God, <damn> it. <laughs> Adit, yeah. I wish I could tell me this. So. I know, I know. Um, but it does, though. It does. Aditya, yeah, yeah, if you could tell me a little bit about, tell us all a little bit about your journey and uh, where you are at Plants and what's happening next. Uh, so, in terms of my journey, I've been working in data science for almost 10 years now in the industry. It's been interesting to see the, you know, the evolution of uh, the, the models itself playing a role in the actual uh, products. So it's been very fascinating for me to see the scale and how ML productionization from, you know, when we are fetching data from DBs to actually building these microservices has evolved. So it's been pretty impressive in the last few years how quickly data science uh, field has evolved. Uh, because uh, the fact is data science in industry is a very nascent field, right? So it's it's evolving and we are still in that place where we are not as mature as software engineering. Uh, but yeah, in terms of my own uh, time, uh, I'm work, I was currently, I was working with Lance till last week and I just recently moved and joined the uh, data science team at MPL, uh, Mobile Premier League Gaming. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. So yeah, that's it all. It is going to be interesting. MPL is, is I think, a uh, forerunner in uh, mobile gaming from out of India. So that's, uh, I mean, very interested to hear how things might shape up for you there. Just a little bit about uh, Venkata and me. We are the hosts. Uh, and for those of you who are joining us uh, for the first time, as in you didn't attend our last session, we are from Scribble Data. We are an ML engineering product company. Our primary offering is a feature store, which for all of those interested in putting ML models into production forms a key part of the ML infra that helps organizations not just put multiple models into production, but also think through uh, the aspects of robustness and trust in the data sets that are underlying the training of those models. So that is really our interest in this space. And uh, over the course of uh, 
our existence as a company, we've had the opportunity to speak to various practitioners. And uh, we love the themes that come up. And by organizing this meetup in collaboration with Hasgeek, it is uh, our way of uh, addressing from other vantage points some of the questions that our own customers throw at us about what it is that makes uh, what that gives returns to date uh, on investment in data science initiatives. So uh, <clears throat> if I can bring the conversation back to the, the original theme that we were talking about, <clears throat> we were saying that, you know, despite growing teams and investments and budgets, very few machine learnings finally reach the production stage. So, so what is productionization and, and what makes it difficult? And, and, and there's this new term that we're all uh, grappling with, which is ML ops. If you can talk through a little bit about what, in your opinion, is the definition of uh, ML productionization and, and why is it difficult, that would be a good jumping off point for the rest of the conversation. Either if you want to take this. A little bit about the kinds of models that you deal with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Aditya, do you want to go first or should I? No, go for it. Okay, cool. Um, so for us, uh, and I'm, I'm really talking from the perspective of uh, what we do at Omnius itself rather than something that's very general is um, we have a we have a bunch of issues taking things into production. The first being that we are not a SaaS based company. So when you're working in the insurance industry uh, and you're trying to build uh, a software for, the, uh, for that industry, the expectation is that you're able to deploy it on premise or on their private cloud, which you absolutely have no access to. So which means if you did a mistake, uh, you have to go through a release cycle before it actually makes uh, makes it through to their production environments. That makes it harder in general uh, in software development itself. The next level of uh, difficulty for us is, um, of course, the privacy of data. And I think this is true for a lot of data science domains where uh, you do not have enough data to train on and you and whatever data that you do get to train on is not really truly representative of any part of the population. I mean, the sample sizes are so small that you make a lot of assumptions. Uh, the, the only way we know our assumptions are valid or invalid is when these models are actually running in pilot stages uh, at our customer site. Uh, and then that's a business issue because the expectation a lot of these companies uh, have is that these models work out of the box, right? And that's not truly really the case because we can't really train models on another customer's data and use it for uh, from customer X to customer Y. So when we go through the entire process of educating around annotation of data, uh, as we deal mostly with texture and uh, uh, data on documents, uh, then sort of bringing machine learning models to train on this da uh, data and use it for pre uh, prediction, everything can break from the very beginning step of identifying what is the schema of the data model all the way through deployment uh, from after it's the model is being trained to something that's in uh, production that they're using for the actual predictions. Complexity of this is hard to solve uh, because you have no idea where what kinds of problems could arise. Is the, is the problem in the data? Is the problem in the fact that the data, there's been a drift in the data from what you used for a pilot to what's being used in production? You also have, because of the data drift model decay, or basically even the concept of drift itself, because the labels that your model's being trained on and what you're actually looking for in production might be completely different. And uh, given that there are other underlying systems that are using your AI systems for automation or augmentation, you bring in a lot of uh, bottlenecks if your systems start to malfunction. And uh, that's in short some of the challenges that we are facing. And through the course of the discussion today, I can probably get a little deeper down some parts of it. Yeah. Um, Aditya, if you want to add something to that, feel free to jump in. Um, else I have a couple more questions. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the primary difference between like why there is like this new term going on around ML ops is what Nishtar was saying, right? Like the biggest component of machine learning models is the data part. And that is something which the traditional DevOps uh, systems were not designed for. So you have to take into account 
like the data, which is the, uh, you know, the uncertainty around data, because as, as Nishra was saying that it can decay and your model performance can go down. You need to have the, uh, proper data versioning around it so that you can capture future trips. So yeah, just want to add that. As a okay. So, um, but you Sorry, I had just one quick question, uh, Venkata. Nishal, you were talking about uh, the various points in the development life cycle where things could go off the rails. Um, when you finally decide that things have been on the rails enough that a model is ready for production deployment, how do you make that judgment call? What, in your testing mindset, what, what do you look for? Can you talk about it at a high level before? Yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, uh, for us, it's, I mean, in general, when you're doing data science itself, you, you're you almost always inferring on a, on a validation set. And uh, uh, the problem with uh, that sort of an, uh, just looking at one model is in production, you're not really just using one machine learning model. Just you sort of have like a chain of models that are connected together to solve a task. So when uh, you have to change the way you look at how you're evaluating machine learning models itself, you're mostly looking at an end-to-end -end performance rather than how good is one model compared to its previous run. And which means that you have to look at the impact of the task that you're trying to automate or solve through the course of the journey that it's going through different models. For that, you're looking at end-to-end -end performances. Uh, you have tolerance levels for different metrics that come together based on how much of error or how much risk you can actually take and the impact that it can possibly have. Um, so that, that's kind of the thought process one normally uses when they're trying to automate tasks or solve a bigger problem uh, with the chain of machine learning models at place. Yeah, wonderful. Um, actually, this, is, this points to another theme that we see, which is that by the time an organization gets to that point of maturity where they can see the opportunity to put one machine learning model into production, it's, it's almost inevitable. They actually have ideas for 10 more, or they actually have 10 more buns in the oven, so to speak. So it's, it's never just one machine learning model and we're done. That organization has much more opportunity, challenges, and eventually ideas as well. Yeah. Um, so Venkata, you were going to ask, um, ask something you want to take up one of the questions from the audience um uh, yeah bef before we uh, there are a couple of questions around versioning and uh, explainability we'll, we'll come. we are we're still sorry i i, I cut in venkat please go on yeah so before that uh, see given all the uncertainty associated with productionization of models right how do you think of uh, the planning uh, around the the process itself in how many different ways could it go wrong and how are you going to recover especially when it is at an arm's length distance in the case of Michel, you can't even access the models they're all offline right uh, behind the firewall of the customer in the case of um, glance for example the scale at which uh, it reaches uh, the number of millions of people it touches uh, means that uh, uh, recovery from errors uh, will also be so much more harder. How how do you think about the uh, risk management around these models? So uh, so uh, I am uh, so uh, in terms of glance, I can give an example. In in general, I think uh, the first thing which we have to evaluate is how uh, how much you are actually replicating your test environment, right? So it can be. Uh, like in terms of glance, it's about like, you know, whether you can do a proper feed recommendation. So, so how much is your actual trainer training data set is a replication of your online data set? Because one of the things which we always have to understand is that in online, there is a feedback loop associated to it as well. You know, the model is making a prediction and you're going to be training on that prediction, which doesn't happen in your training data set. So, but as a, as a checklist, the way I look at it is a, uh, how much, uh, close my offline data set is to my online data set, like how quickly I'm able to replicate that and be uh, the infra requirements, right? So any model, uh, when you're shipping the model to production, you need to understand in which infra environment you're going, right? And, uh, and see whether this model is giving you any critical gain if it's a very new model, right? For example, uh, I'm building a neural network model which has 30 layers, right? Now to productionize this model will take me a lot more effort compared to uh, productionizing a logistic regression model 
and at this point of time you have to question yourself whether that gain whether it be 2% or 10% is is impactful enough for the product itself because if it's not then you should be looking into the simpler model it's easier to debug it's easier to productionize so that's how uh, you know i'll be going ahead with that that would be my suggestion essentially for i mean for us it's um, in general it's it's a it's a little different sort of a challenge um and this is one of the reasons why uh, we can't avoid the risk and and i'm being very frank about this is there's no way for us to actually uh, say with 100% conviction that everything's going to work so we are taking risks when we're doing this but we make the customers aware of this so we we spend some time educating around the risks and what could be the potential problems we talk to them about understanding machine learning confidences so we we really training when they get predictions either to their downstream system or they're using an application where they can look at and visualize our predictions we uh, we have documentation and we go through different iterations of telling our customers what is confidence what is what is the difference between a prediction accuracy and a confidence how can you make use of something why is training data very important how do you keep consistent training data uh which leads us to a point where you can't build these processes in the beginning there are certain bridges that you burn uh there are certain uh, situations where you land yourself into from which you sort of rise and build processes that are important and relevant because it's impossible to identify everything in the beginning and also it doesn't make sense to build everything from the beginning i mean mm -hmm. uh, you're a startup trying to solve a problem so you're really looking at make it work make it right and make it fast so you have to if if we don't embrace that sort of mindset across our entire engineering and product team we could build an ml ops platform for the next 5 years because or even 10 because there's so many uh, conditions and so many different parameters that can go in but it could then have end up having zero impact for a customer so keep so it's this definitely a trade off uh yes when you if you have to go from the make it work to make it accurate right you need a feedback uh, loop so keep this yeah. question was that uh, let's say the uh, model is behind the firewall and uh, uh, it has uh, failed for some definition of fail how do you get back all the the how do you extract enough information from the context uh, the weights of the intermediate layers and so on to be able to actually do it right the next iteration i mean the expectation here venkata is i think one of the most important things to understand with on premise models itself is you are more or less providing an ecosystem for the customers to train and use the model there you you don't really have the most of the times especially in de dealing with private information right either you're working for at a, in the hospital space or the insurance or finances uh, you might not have the the capability to actually bring these weights back you might and it's not really just about the weights right so it's it's a combination of your model and the data that has been used to uh, to work with uh, at this point in time for us uh, we've built the capability for the platform itself the ml ops platform that the customers can use to retrain so our feedback loop is that you train on a small set of data which is not really representing if, like the sample is so small but the machine learning model can start predicting so the amount of time you spend on doing annotations reduces because the model predicts and let's assume if the model is even 50% accurate right so it predicts 100 fields but 50 are right and 50 are false you still reduce the time in annotation so whatever is correct is left whatever is erroneous is fixed and that is a feedback loop again to train the next model and you always keep an inference set and you sort of provide the metrics so that people can decide based on the metrics if they want to publish the newly trained model to production and this is i think the point that aditya was trying to touch on when he said is ml ops is very important because it's not really just about the machine learning model or the operations or the data it's a, it's like an intersection of this where you have the feedback loop coming in and you have to provide mechanisms to reduce your risk of 
data versioning, model versioning, and sort of have reports generated on top of this. So it can be reproduced and the decisions can be taken on based on this. So if the new model that goes into production is Verser, you have an immediate mechanism to at least roll back to maybe not the best model, but at least a better model. And uh, those are checks and balances that you have to build in into your system. Yeah, Anishal, I have a question. Uh, so when you're doing these on-premise uh, deployment, right? Like how do you isolate your engineering works versus like the modeling work? So like the... Yeah, I mean, um, it is quite hard for us to differentiate between that because there are things that can go wrong on the engineering side and there are things that can go wrong on, on the modeling side as well. Uh, so we've built in, for example, logging mechanisms for both, right? And we've uh, the way we do the inferencing as well is we've sort of created two ecosystems. So when you deploy our entire uh, application onto a customer landscape, you sort of have uh, an, um, a differentiation between or an abstraction where you're just staging all your data, you're annotating it and you're training, and this is not really used for prediction. And then whatever you're using for prediction, you're sort of building capability into the platform to analyze the capacity of the prediction and to analyze the capacity of validation and training. So you're, you're trying to build these things there. And of course, things can go wrong, leading to tickets that are being created at the service desk, where it is on us that we have to infer if it's an engineering issue, if it's a model issue, and how do we go about? It's a very thin line as it's actually quite hard for to educate um, anybody around this as sometimes it's even confusing for us if it's our data pipeline that's going wrong, if it's our post-processing that's going wrong, pre-processing. So of course, logs help us, but uh, some it, it's it's hard. I, I don't have a definite answer as it changes from use cases to use cases for different customers. Which is fine. I think one of the promises we had made to our listeners during our previous session was that we'd be bringing them war stories, uh, not just uh, here's what you should do, here's the prescriptive PowerPoint, do this and you'll be perfectly okay. It's good to know that even at the cutting edge of being able to deploy these models with some amount of confidence. When I say cutting edge, I mean people who are willing to stake revenue impacting, bottom line impacting decisions or outcomes on these models. Even there, there is this uncertainty because the truth is that despite all the hype, it is only now that we're getting to that reasonable state of maturity where we're actually being able to put these things into operation. So uh, I really appreciated that answer. And in fact, um, this brings me to two questions for Aditya. Aditya, one is if you could help just concoct for us a definition of ML ops so that we are all speaking the same language. And two is that business about not releasing on Fridays. I mean, I think people will figure out very easily, but then you can talk a little bit about why not, what can go wrong, what's a better practice? Uh, so, uh, so I can give you my de definition and then I think I'll let the group decide come to a definition itself. So in terms of me, uh, myself, I, the way I look at MLOps is the uh, MLOps is essentially the ecosystem around the model. And that can be on the pre-processing side, it can be the post-processing side, and it is actually uh, serving up the model itself. So any anything which is, uh, so everything and anything which is encompassing a model is MLOps for me. So that is my definition in short. Uh, in terms of uh, Friday releases, I would say uh, if you don't want your weekend to be ruined, please don't release a model on Friday. I've had issues when uh, we have de we have deployed an amazing model on a Friday where all our offline numbers were looking great and, and we were bullish about this model and we wanted to get the experimentation started early and uh, and and it just went horribly wrong, you know, uh, and, uh, and in, in this point of time, it was because of a bug in the engineering, like uh, on Friday, you have a bit of a, uh, sometimes you have a bit of a attention span, less attention span as well. So we had an engineering bug and we actually had to come back on a Saturday and, you know, do the things. But in general, uh, I obviously avoid because uh, you're, you're setting up, you're, uh, you're taking a responsibility of production environment, right? So you cannot, even if an Azure out, even, even a cloud outage would help you, would make your life miserable on a Friday. So that's my story. So what what period of time is that golden window for which if things run okay, 
you're mm-hmm. like all right my weekend or my at least my night whatever the next night is is going to be reasonably okay and what do you look for what is your mental checklist looking for um, beyond the usual metrics what what how do you look at your models performance and for how long uh so i think uh, one a couple of things right like a uh, off, all your offline metrics should be good to go i think that is the primary thing uh b uh, your uh, your infrastructure should be uh, ready for your model to be deployed mm-hmm. uh so that you can uh, you can make the model productionizable as soon as possible and uh, c uh, you also need to understand what impact this model is going to have for example if it's a if it's a revenue uh, generating model i would be very very conservative in putting it out even if the offline numbers are really good because i want to study it think about it before putting a model in production uh and if it's a model which is essentially for a a model which is not impacting it it's a low it's a conservative it's an aggressive i can take an aggressive strategy even push it every two once every uh, twice every, every week right i can do that so i can mm-hmm. push a model on a thursday and a monday and and do an ab together mm-hmm. so that has been my strategy um the best day is wednesday by the way just putting it out there <laughs> thank you <laughs> uh do you put something in today i uh, you know let's you know, you're done but the models uh, take different amounts of uh, time to settle down right in some sense there is uh, always some fine tuning to be done and also you have to think about refreshes there was a question about uh, when do you refresh a model yeah. right i mean how do you how do you understand the performance uh, of the model and what instrumentation do you have to monitor it uh so i'll t- i'll take it into uh, two parts right the first question is how do you handle refreshes and the second question is uh, how do you handle uh, the other what was the other part how do you monitor the health of that model like right? okay. you know related so, yeah so i guess there is at least i haven't been able to find out a formula, formula where you know i've been able to figure out the right refresh cycle of a model uh, and that's where you know a, a healthy ml ops Uh, ecosystem helps you out because what you can do is you check your uh, your metrics how they are performing in the initial days and how they become stale and you also check your input your data feature distribution right because as your model goes gets older the feature distribution is will start becoming out of sample for the model so the I, so at least in my experience i have seen it it becomes an art of monitor keep on monitoring it uh, so that you can uh, figure out the most optimum refresh cycle Uh, it can be from a for a model once a month to every 3 days depending on how quickly the data is changing uh but yeah so usually the way i have done it is i i in the beginning i try to train it every day even though if it's costing me money to train retrain a model again and again but i also try to notice is how much the feature changes changes during the course of a week or a, or a month and based on that i will change my refresh cycle there is a related uh, uh, question which is that uh, you know you will eventually realize that your model is wrong is already degraded beyond a certain point how do you handle the transitions between model versions and also the downtime associated with models uh sorry i i had a intuition uh so i think uh, the biggest thing you you need to understand is you always have to divide so the way i look at it is i try to see uh, a very simple matrix like i try to see the number of predicted labels divided by the number of total labels in my test set set so if the test if that and uh, and i call it calibration right like calibration of the data set so i'll try to look at that and i'll try to see how much that is changing from my training data set so i'll just have that like i'll have a guiding metric which i have to keep on monitoring if things are going really wrong because if i'm not able to make the prediction if that if that ratio is not consistent then i have to have a pull back so in this case what if it's a model which is just being released i'll try to go to the base model so that you know that ratio where i know that the ratio is correct so that's how i usually do it um initial uh, yeah i mean managers right the uh, migration after looking- sorry i i believe that in your case the client uh, data scientists manage the migration after looking at the metrics yeah i mean it might not really be a data scientist so the 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 thing that we are trying to do at omnius is we are not trying to make this exclusively op, uh, operatable only by uh, data scientists this uh, the idea for us is data science is a part of the system and it's the entire product that should support that is powered by 
the data science capabilities that help our customers. So if we expect just data scientists to understand this, then we are in a situation because then data scientists have more questions than migrating model from one ecosystem to the other, right? Um, but for us, uh, what we are doing is we have an inference set both of during the training and we have it during the prediction as well. So for us, if we look at the inference, the confidence of the model going down on the inference set from its previous times on how it was predicting for a task, uh, that's actually a pointer for us to say either there has been a data drift, uh, that the data that the model is being trained on and the inference set that we have is actually quite uh, different. And we have to then talk to the customers themselves in trying to understand when they raise these questions on why it's happening. Um, or uh, we know that the automation of the tasks are poor. Like they, if they would expect 40% or 50% of their entire tasks to be automated at a certain tolerance level. And they see that it's just 10 to 15% and everything else is back to their manual workforce. That's definitely an alarm for us. And at that point in time, uh, we actually have to go to the site of our customer because we have to get into their uh, landscape. Uh, we have, they give us access to a machine that's in one room. And then we're looking at the data and uh, what the model is predicting and the confidence values and skimming over all the configurations that we have. And then we come back with some idea on what are the improvements that we can push um, depending on the, on the necessity if it needs to be done. How quickly can it be done? And sometimes we might not have an answer and uh, mm -hmm. we have to really then go back to the boards and see what we can do. I have a couple of questions. Um, one of them is from one of our uh, audience members, which is uh, uh, about uh, what happens, how to handle the model retraining downtime. This is from Chaitanya. And uh, potentially related to that is, you know, uh, Imagine you've just put a model into production and something is going awry. Um, my question to you would be, at that point, what are the fail safes that you have? Uh, is, it, is it a function of just taking it offline or is there, uh, is it, do you have the previous version lined up ready to go with stakeholder management also in place that that is, that is the, the way that we will default? How do you think through that? I mean, I think one of the things that I would really like to bring here is uh, this is not actually new. I mean, if when, when the entire advent of business analytics and data warehousing and ETL pipelines and all of this came into place, um, this was the same problem that they tried to address. Do you want to do ETL on a transactional database with live traffic that's coming in or do we want to take a different approach? And uh, if you think on those lines, your transactional system is running as is. You never uh, disrupt a transactional system. You let it run through how it is and you sort of build ETL pipelines to bring all of the data from a transactional system to an analytics data warehouse. And then you do whatever you do on top of it. You use MapReduce, Spark uh, jobs, whatever you have, right? Um, in the same way, uh, once that evolved, uh, the next decision that was taken was, do you want to do real-time analytics along with batch analytics, uh, where that's how the Lambda architecture evolved, where you could do both uh, at the same point in time. Now you can think about models in the same way. So you can have a system that does not touch the, pr the prediction system right now that's running in production, where you have the training that's running independent of the impact that it has on production, right? And depending on a downtime where your number of customers that you have are the least or an actual schedule maintenance downtime. You could, if you let your customers know beforehand, especially in an enterprise world, which you can, you can bring the system down and you can start uh, routing, uh, you can start updating the model. Of course, one of the better approaches uh, for managing this is also what the software industry has already done where A-B testing. So you can route traffic not entirely to the latest model. So you can slowly increase that foothold. So you have service measures to do this right now. So if you're running everything on something like Kubernetes with Istio, or even if you have very simple rules on Nginx, where you can route your traffic accordingly, 
So you don't necessarily root 100% immediately if you're not sure. You slowly start bringing that up. Yes, you do have the potential of hot swaps that you can do where you change the model on the fly, uh, but you always build a fail-safe mechanism. If the model, if the service, if the model is too big to be stored on memory or there's some other malfunction, you can have, and trust me, you can have Unicode, decode, encode issues when you're bringing things up and translating because certain component in the pipeline changed with this new model, right? So you always, if you're doing hot swapping, you build fail-safe mechanisms where if your requests are coming in and they're failing, like two or 3% of your requests fail, you immediately roll back to the previous one. So you sort of keep the other service up and running with no traffic coming in. And if everything's okay, you're fine. If not, you, you shift the traffic accordingly. I remember Aditya when we were discussing some months back where the slow incremental rollout may not be an option. Sometimes we have to have a step function as we have to sort a certain cross a certain threshold in order to be able to see a substantial sample of the, the traffic uh, to run your model. I was wondering how you take your management along on the risks associated with uh, those kinds of jumps. Uh, so, uh, I think it's, it's around the AB framework as Nishil was talking about, right? Like a lot of times, uh, before designing the AB, it, it, you have to make sure that the AB is statistically significant because otherwise what's going to happen is that the, on the most of the time, the AB is going to give you a neutral result. Uh, so yes, uh, you will have to have a response you as a data scientist, you will have to have a responsibility of figuring out what that traffic needs to be. And then you also have to make sure to align the other uh, collaborators, right? Like as Nishtil was talking about earlier as well, that it's not just a data science model, it's a product which is going out, right? So it needs to have everybody aligned on the expectations around it and why you need to have uh, a bigger AB, right? In terms of this, current, this situation where you can uh, prove that uh, the model is working or not, because otherwise what's gonna happen is that you're gonna be iterating very slowly. And, and if, if you keep on having these ABs with neutral results, it's not going to aid in any product development. So I wouldn't call it model. I would say product development. So, yeah. So I think these are the initial steps which you have to have like alignment. A couple of other questions uh, that came up, uh, one from uh, Kirti and one from uh, uh, Neeraj, uh, both associated with the uh, rollout of the uh, many versions. Now there are there is data versioning, there is model versioning, and then there is uh, the Docker versioning, which is the combination of these two. Now you're talking about uh, a large number of uh, combinations, and uh, uh, you have to work through all of these details to even know whether uh, something is specific to you, this particular model version, this particular data version, this particular Docker build, and so on. Do you uh, have uh, standardized practices? to be able to cope with all of this complexity. And if bad things uh, happen, um, one of the, the Kirti was asking, um, uh, is there any, uh, now do you use any kind of capability of the model to uh, explainability capability in the model or explainability tools like SHAP and so on to even understand what has happened? How do you manage the evolution with the yeah. number of model versions? Okay, Aditya? Can I take this first? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So again, maybe because I started off more in, in the software and then eventually moved to data science over the last eight, nine years is um, you have to think about the code that generates the model. Uh, like you would think about how you manage software itself. You had uh, built graduations before and they don't change. So you need to, you need, you have different levels of build graduation now, right? So you, your code has a build graduation that generates a Docker artifact, which has code that can train a model, right? And then now the, the model that is being trained with this code is also not just dependent on the code, but it's also dependent on the data. So you have to decide based on the data that you're working with, what is the kind of snapshot that you have? So if you boil down to something uh, like a metaphor like Git, you're, you're sort of having tags for everything. Your data has a tag, your model, your code has a tag, your model has a tag, and all of them put together is basically your experiment. 
and uh, depending on the problem that you're trying to solve you build your build graduation taking all of this into account you you sort of have a mechanism to be able to say i want to have this data like i want to look at my report and the report goes saying this data with this snapshot which is basically the tag this code base and this model was the one that's generated with all of the inferencing that you have right um and to be honest this this problem is not it's harder to solve because of the size of the data sometimes and the size of the models that you have but not really from a conceptual point of view from a conceptual point of view you have a lot of frameworks that support in this like for example there's dvc there's ml flow from databricks uh, there are a bunch of other to tools uh, and systems that are coming together uh, that you can use in in making this happen so one uh, why advice that i would give is usually as data scientists or engineers we want to build a lot of these cool stuff ourselves right so the first thing when you think about these problems we want to try and solve it immediately with our own bare hands so try to avoid that instinct because uh, i actually did that uh, so when i started working at omnius and we started thinking about this i decided to come up with uh, and i'm saying i and not we because it was literally i so i decided to come up with a framework that using mongo and and other things that we can do data versioning and metadata tagging and everything and i presented this at a conference and one of the or people in the audience was like have you looked at dvc do you guys have you looked at something else like why are you doing this like what's your like are you trying to build something big uh, we, they were genuinely interested because they thought omnius is related in building model versioning and data versioning platform um and that opened up a different door and sort of a thought process around the fact that ml ops even though the word that's being coined is new there are lots of companies doing this so reading their blog posts reading open source frameworks that are there can can help you a lot in understanding how to solve these problems the second part of the question you know in building an explainability for models it's not that easy i mean if you're using a deep learning frameworks building explainability is a research project in itself and normally companies do not have the bandwidth or the time to do this ideally you're relying on on the giant on the shoulders of the giants right you're expecting google amazon facebook linkedin microsoft stanford research mit all of these people or or more coming up with research with their uh, their phd candidates doing prime research and releasing papers on explainability of models and open source frameworks that you can use and see if it makes sense you have to keep your eye out depending on the problem that you are trying to solve uh, we do have some explainability that we use for computer vision algorithms where we sort of like present a heat map on what i think we lost nishchal i think give it a second while we are waiting for him a uh, quick plug uh, he talked about dvc so uh two weeks out which is on the 17th of this month we will be talking to the authors of dvc actually so do stay tuned for that yes and this whole framing that um, uh data science as a software engineering discipline where uh, the lessons learned over the past 30 years uh can be applied to data science is uh, will be a entire uh, you know session uh, yeah absolutely Yeah. So while Michel can come back, uh, Aditya, you you want to uh, take a stab at this as well. Uh, the question around interpretability of the models. Interpretability uh, and the management of the the uh, versions of the data, especially yours at yours, you, you must have uh, very large data sets. Yeah. So uh, again, so I think. Uh, Uh, interpretability of model depends on use case to use case right for example uh, when i was working in healthcare it was a very big issue and uh, and uh, it becomes an important thing because you are essentially uh, making prediction on human data and that becomes a very critical uh, decision and giving some certain insights to the guys who are taking a decision on based on your model is the is a is something which you have to provide so uh, that is the first thing Uh, so even uh, but at the same time um, 
I think if you are in your journey where you are just building out your first model and putting it in production, interpretability is good because that way you can uh, not only align the other pods. I'm you know uh, engineering product, but you can also have a higher debuggability in your own code, right? Like what is going wrong, what is not going right. Uh, but as your code and as your uh, system start maturing and you move into these high level model, I think uh, most of the time you are. Uh, you are only going into interpretability if something definitely has gone wrong drastically, and usually you are trying to understand based on your logs, and you also try to understand based on your validation data set. I have a question, Aditya. Uh, you you mentioned interpretability comes into the picture if something has gone drastically wrong. Do you? I, I just want you to uh, reflect on this, or, or rather, project outwards. Maybe do you think with uh, uh, more regulatory compliance heavy places, this is going to be more of an issue where it's not just about if it has gone drastically wrong versus audits, for example. Do you think that that might play a, play a different role? I think uh, in, uh, more than interpretability at that point of time, uh, the thing which I think the models will have to capture would be the uncertainty around the model prediction. Like, you know, how, how, how confident you are about your own model to make a prediction. And I think that would be where the regulatory compliances would be asking you about. For example, if you have, if you have trained a model for uh, for just uh, loan selection, right? Like how well, I think uh, be not the explainability, but even for you to back your model is the uncertainty part, right? And you should not be uh, making a prediction like that if your model itself is uncertain. So I think uh, a it, there would be interpretability, but b you have to have an uncertainty built around it once these regulations start coming in. Yeah. So, uh, Venkata, shall we take a question from the group? One of the. Yeah. the so there was, there was a question about um, the DVC. Neeraj uh, um, is very keen on understanding how you manage uh, versions of your uh, uh, data. Um, we talked about uh, DVC. Uh, do you layer any processes, any. Um, for example, one of the simplest thing is DVC will allow you to check in the data set, but you have to value, uh, you have to quality check that uh, data set and uh, prepare it enough to be able to be used a few weeks and months uh, down the line. Um, so can you dig in a little bit into the um, data versioning and tell us if you are doing something unique, different beyond uh, DVC itself or some of these tools? I think Nishchil is back. Nishchil, you want to take this question? Like, yes. Okay. Sorry, guys. Of course, I had to drop off. I mean, it had to happen at some point. Someone drops off. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, for us, uh, so there are two aspects to model versioning itself, and one of the challenges that we face is the data set that we deal with is not. Uh, numeric or structured data. So we have a lot of images and we have uh, XMLs where we where we store all of the metadata and the actual contents of the document itself. Um, and what we ended up doing was uh, we actually used Git LFS and sort of put all of our page XMLs uh, with different snapshots, basically created simple Git tags on top of it and used during the experiment, basically the experiment would check out that particular Git tag and sort of run that experiment. And that worked great for us as we're not really on the cloud and we have a mini data center in our office that we've set up. So we run experiments on all of the GPUs and everything there. So the data transfer between like something like a NAS data store to that of a system that where the experiment is running on, there is there's not much latency. So that for us is, is a lot of, uh, is, is a big difference in the way we do data versioning itself. But in general, data versioning gets more and more complex uh, as the size of the data grows. And usually uh, it's, sometimes it grows exponentially. And when you're checking in all of this data and checking it out, that's, that probably takes hours together, especially if the data is on the cloud somewhere and you're pulling it to your local infrastructure to run it on or, or, or on another system that's present. Um, it's very important to have even nodes for the tags that are generated. So for example, I mean, this is not, so one of the things that I really want to emphasize on is a lot of these thought process cannot come from one single person on the team. So this is 
if you want to do ml ops it's the mindset of the entire team so you need champions from within the team that have to come up and and sort of go through this process and the pain of doing this because um for us we have a few data scientists who are actually very focused in in on in creating instrumentation around how do you validate a data set how do you verify mm-hmm. a data set how do you tag a data set how is it actually being used so a lot of the discussions that i'm putting forth today or my ideas are a uh, basically champion from within the team so if, if when you want to do this data versioning part of it uh, it's not just data engineers or people on the uh, on the product who can decide this it's, it's basically everybody who has to come together to say okay these are the challenges that we have and based on the do are we okay with the latency of upload and download how quickly do we want this to be trained how are we doing the verification is it even important for us to do the verification these are questions that are answered based on a problem mm-hmm. and depending on that you choose tools i mean we are currently using ml flow for just model versioning whereas we use something like git lfs with the tags for the data versioning part of it so this data science as a team sport right and ml ops as a team sport is an interesting idea it is uh, um i wish be more people would talk about it i know that aditya you had a team of almost 12 people and you were dealing with a large uh, data engineering team and also large management teams in mobi is a beast so how <laughs> how do you um, uh, uh, how do you take people along and align the the tooling and the processes and the thinking uh i think uh, in terms of uh, as nishal was saying right like uh, like uh, internally it's mostly around education because not everybody are champions of these things because everybody wants to build better and cooler models right i think that's the that's the whole premise around it so i think uh, having internal champions which can actually come up and say why these things are important is really 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 critical for the success of data science team in general uh and regarding the external i think uh, you have to align the external uh, when i say external i mean the inside the ca- company the external pods you have to align the the, uh, the the other pods especially people who you work closely with for example uh, the product teams the the engineering team on and educate them about each and everything uh, around the this journey and when you are taking so what we did it in mobi was that we had a and uh, we and because it was uh, it was both with product and business folks we actually kept an excel actually like like the most simplistic tool we kept an excel and and that's where we were populating our versions and our journey because a it became super easy to share with everybody what was happening and b you can catch bugs and you can report it there so we we were doing data versioning uh, using an an ml flow but at the end uh, when we had to open it up to the external folks it was the excel which came to the rescue so because it everybody can understand it it's it's tabular you can view it and and uh, and you can even and and somebody else can also debug the issue right it's just not you then because then a product guy can can say hey the metrics were really good and fair when you did this change in fair when in march this thing happened how uh, would what something did something happen to the data so it actually becomes a very cross collaborative uh, atmosphere when they get access to all these things uh because nowadays everybody has that acumen now it's not like about education anymore why these things are important so i thought so that was a super useful tool for us in the end yeah indra okay um enough is enough aditya <laughs> sorry i i promise that see that that some point during this conversation no but in all seriousness the question that i had is uh look the way guys i'm sorry my internet is not stable i can you hear me if i can just get yes, yes. Yeah. yeah yeah we can we can okay it's 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 back now okay so the question that i had is this we talked about it being a team sport we talked about the kind of attention that goes into validating these models then putting them into production the kind of uh meticulous a uh, babysitting that goes into these models once they are in production bringing the stakeholders along all of this sounds like immensely expensive activities when i say expensive i mean that here is this data scientist who both has been at this organization for a while understands the domain understands uh, obviously the techniques and is able to then build models that put return that show return on investment but at the same time so much of their mental bandwidth is going into nurturing this baby which means i want to ask you the question is there 
do you see any opportunity cost right now maybe to, in today in, in the middle of 2020 where the same data scientists who could have i ideally moved on to the next business case you said that they want to work on cool things move on to the next one but the way that all of this is structured right now they do have to pay so much more attention to that original to that first model that they built or the second model and in that sense they are constricted in how much they can actually do for the organization am i am i somewhere in the ballpark i yeah, i mean i think it's possible. <laughs> yeah i mean i think i speak for maybe okay. aditya aditya and i when i say this it's not just with the data scientists but also with everybody in a data science organization you are uh, when you're building these things um you it's not about what you've done in the past and it's already in production so you just move on so there are parts of it that you're always hanging on to it's like um uh ex relationships that you have you have you carry some parts of it and then and then you move on to to different things but there are certain things you just you probably never let go so for us uh one of the key things here that's actually helped us quite well is we sort of try to change people who are working on the problem like we explicitly move around people uh we because we don't really hire I mean when we do the hiring part of it of course we look at certain specific skill sets that we might need for computer vision or natural language processing or data engineering um but what the way we try and do uh, here is we try to mix it up a little bit so we run teams where data engineers understand what the model is trying to do and how it can be trained or retrained and we have data scientists who are shuffled around as well based on different problems sometimes people who are on production line for uh for quite some time we move them back to a little bit of research and and give them some some time to breathe and look at new experiments so and run a few things present papers speak at conferences um uh, i think what is not spoken about quite often is the mental pressure uh, and the psychological pressure that uh is pushed on people especially for part of data science and ml teams right Uh, it's a lot of pressure it's a lot of stress because you are changing and questioning the status quo of not just your organization but for another organization where you are having this impact on so one of the core uh, necessities for people who are leading these teams are not just technical acumen i mean people everybody these days and i'm and i say this with a lot of pride there are college graduates or people who are not yet graduated who probably have a better understanding of deep learning than i do and and i've been doing it for quite some time so it's not really just the technical aspect of it so team leads really have to spend some time understanding the pressure the the emotional stress the emotional trauma that that everybody goes through their failures their ups and downs and they have to work with it and sort of build long term focused teams rather than just look at it from say okay the model doesn't work the pipeline doesn't work so you have to spend nights together and then once that's done uh there's no room for appreciation you're on to the next one so you really have to bring in the humanity part of it and the fun into doing these things uh, which makes at least uh ex relationships not that bad <laughs> what a wonderful wonderful answer i really enjoyed that because you brought a, a very human element back into into this mix which is i mean there's it's great to have the hype it's great to be able to roll these out but at the end of the day there's a there's a cost there's a serious cost associated with all of this um we are at 7 pm right now are there any closing thoughts that either of you would like to share with us aditya maybe you can go first <laughs> uh i think uh, it 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 is actually uh, like part of the question which you asked indra like uh, like always data scientists would like to move on to better things because everybody has this assumption that data scientist uh, time is expensive uh, and stuff like that but i feel like the more uh, data scientists actually get entrenched into this uh, journey of taking a model from the inception to production the better a data scientist will become because a when he he'll be able to understand the actual execution part that it's not a offline metric like accuracy or auc for him anymore it's the 
it's the business side and he'll be able to understand the users better and in the end data science is all about understanding users so i think uh, just a closing thought on the last question that it's really critical to uh, have every data scientist go through this journey to have a better understanding uh, sorry 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 i cut you off no no please finish your thought i didn't i didn't realize go ahead Oh uh, no, that's uh, yeah. So that was the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, so then I I have one thought that might uh, just reflects a little bit of where what you said intersects with what uh, the way we think about our yeah. narrow lane, our lane being features, feature engineering, the feature store, which is that, uh, and I don't remember who we borrowed or stole the this idea from, but you know when features are computed, the idea is to be able to put them into a marketplace so that different data scientists from within a customer organization are able to see, okay, this feature is already being computed every day or whatever periodicity, I can start to use it already. But when a data scientist chooses to use a feature, we almost want them to pay a cost, pay, a, pay monopoly money almost, because we want the cost of each of these little building blocks to be felt throughout the organization because there is that cost in keeping that feature running, keeping it alive. And I think somewhere when you were talking about having the data scientists go through the entire process and see the, the cost of putting something into production, all of these things get accounted for when various choices are made. I want to experiment with this, or oh, I want to put that into production. Somewhere all of the costs have to be accounted for. That's when you start to get the return on the investment. If you don't think about what the investment is, you can't get returns on it. Exactly, it's yeah. true. And we also uh, extending the thought, uh, productionization, uh, you, you can choose to disagree with me. Um, we believe that productionization fundamentally changes the economics of data science. Because now you have to think about uh, a, a system, a process, a model that has business impact, that has lots of operational costs over a long period of time. Yeah. So you have to account for every cost that you pay every day, you know, in every function in your organization. All right. Yeah. On that happy, actually, <laughs> on that down note, on that down note of accounting for every last cost, um, model productionization is serious business. Um, mm -hmm. There are many ways to get it wrong, but uh, I really, really appreciate your sharing your stories with me about what it takes, to, what it means to get it wrong, how to recover from that, how to think through things when you when you actually learn and improve. Um, I expect that some people that may have questions may add them to the HasGeek events page. We will relay those to you uh, so that between now and our next talk, we would love to be able to get some of the, the answers to those questions. And uh, I'm also hoping that for most people who have attended this talk, you would be open to connecting with them on a platform like LinkedIn. I'll just put that out there. You can violently shake your head if that's not the case. But I think we have a good <laughs> audience here and those networks can only do us all good if we enrich them. So another way, that, uh, the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Venkata, something else? Yes, yes. Another way, I, I know for that um, for Nischel, the opportunities for immobilized uh, uh, people is very close to his heart. I mean, people because of accidents, because of other constraints, they are not able to move out of the house. And uh, these are difficult circumstances when they don't have uh, as many opportunities. Um, I know that uh, Nischel is is working uh, uh, on that. It, it is it's a it's a passion of his. So if the community knows about Mechanical Turk or anything that will open doors for people to work from home, um, uh, especially the disadvantaged folks, um, I think as hosts as Nischel and uh, all of us will be better off. Anything else you want to add, Mr. To that, please, please, please write to me if you know anything. I mean, uh, we have added the um, Twitter link uh, to yeah. on the page itself. There is also LinkedIn. Uh, if you can't uh, reach anybody, you uh, please reach us, uh, Scribble, and we will be more than happy to um, connect you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. It's it's been fantastic. Um, both Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you Aditya and Nishal for being present in every format, not just because, because you made your time, but because you gave us this warm energy as well. So thank you very, very much. It's like a yoga class ending now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Right. Have Thanks, a nice guys. day. Yeah, bye-bye.
Uh, by the way, uh, folks, don't forget to attend the next session we have with uh, DVC founders uh, Dimitri and uh, Ivan. Uh, on seventeenth June, you can you will get the announcements on uh, the fifth elephant page at Health Geek. Uh, thanks, awesome. thanks, thank thanks, you, thanks. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, guys, thank you, everybody. Okay.